everyone, my name is Hannah and I'm one of the education managers here at the Maryland Zoo. I'd like to welcome you to the first virtual field talk with the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project. We had some technical difficulties and we're not able to record the webinar for the first five minutes. But I'd like to go ahead and introduce Dr. Lucy Kemp, the project manager for the Mabula Ground Hornbill Project and co-chair for the IUCN Hornbill Specialist Group. Dr. Kemp holds multiple degrees, including a PhD from the University of the Free State. She is also a conservation planner in training through the IUCN Species Survival Commission and Conservation Planning Specialist Group. I'm excited that Dr. Kemp is here with us today to talk about conserving an African icon, the Southern Ground Hornbill. We hope that you enjoy this presentation. And so they're real, uh, a really integral part um, of, of the landscape in sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. And unfortunately, the problem really seems to be us. There are a few biological threats, things, you know, just like climate change, um, our habitats getting hotter here, um, and they're struggling to breed in the face of that. We're losing um, uh, fledglings to, to, well, not fledglings, not even nestlings to embryo death um, due to the extended heat waves that we have now. Um, but most of the threats are really what we're doing to these birds. Next slide. And so just to take you through a number of the threats that they do face, um, probably one of the primary limiting factors um, in, in the, the better protected areas is the loss of nests. Um, we're still losing big trees to flood regimes, to fire, to elephant impacts, to fungus, to termites. And the loss of these big trees means that often for these groups, even within their huge territories, they don't necessarily have a single suitable nest tree, um, which means that those birds are unlikely to breed and we need to try and think of ways to support them with that. Um, in terms of poisoning, that's probably the greatest threat to the, to the species. Secondary poisoning, we still have a lot of farmers that put out poison bait for uh, so-called pest species like jackal and hyena. Um, and ground hornbills will scavenge. You know, they're very opportunistic, they're smart. So if they see a free meal, they're absolutely all going to dig in. And unfortunately, what that means is we lose not just an individual within a group, but we lose an entire group, an entire breeding unit. Um, and so each of these poisoning incidents really has a big um, knock-on effect on the population sustainability for the species. Um, and something that's come up, which I'm sure in the States you're all very aware of, of lead toxicosis. Um, we've known it, as you do, that it's a major threat to the vultures, um, but we've now found that it's equally a threat to the ground hornbills. Um, so any spent lead ammunition left in the felts, whether it's offal that's left after a hunt, um, or a, a, um, the, with the wing shooters of a, a game bird is winged and, and left to die in the bush, if the ground hornbills find that, they will eat it. And the ingestion of even the a tiniest piece of lead is enough to kill a ground Hornbill. And so we're working very hard with all of our hunting associations to try and rectify that. Um, and unfortunately, you've made much further gains in the States. So we're still quite behind on this, um, but luckily we're able to step on the stepping stones of all the research that's been done in the States um, to help us try and come up with solutions faster than that. Um, in terms of electrocution, ground hornbills love to roost on big open roost structures. Um, and what happens is often they roost on electrical infrastructure and being big birds, they're super inquisitive. You know, they'll pick with their beak and a big wingspan. And there's a very good chance that they become electrocuted between two live wires. And so we're working with our electrical parastatal to try and insulate as many of the transformer boxes as certainly those that are near existing nests. Um, and so that's an ongoing project. Um, and then in terms of persecution, ground hornbills are extremely um, territorial. And so unfortunately, if they see the reflection in a shiny surface, their first response is to try and attack this intruder in their territory. Um, and unfortunately, what happens is that that leads to a number of broken windows. Broken windows is an expense, and that leads to unhappy neighbors. Um, and even the most conservation-minded farmer, after the birds a group has broken every window on his property you know, five or six times, he's going to just give up and, and do something to remove the problem. Um, and then there's still a little bit of trade, not so much in South Africa, but more so north of the range, although there is limited internal trade for the traditional medicine market. So these are some of the threats that the birds are facing, um, and unfortunately most of them are to do with us. Next slide, please.
And it's not just that they've got us to contend with, they're not really designed for this fast paced world of ours. Um, and so a number of their life history strategies makes them much more vulnerable to extinction. They live very long, you know, they can live anything up to 70 years. Um, there's examples in captivity of birds over 50 still breeding successfully. They big, they have very low productivity. So they will uh, fledge a maximum of one chick per year. Um, even in a group of nine or 12 birds, there's still only one breeding female and they will only successfully fledge one chick. They reach sexual maturity really late, so in captivity it's around 10 years, um, but it's much later in, in the wild context because those birds first have to attain that really important social breeding structure, they need to work their way through the ranks until they can become an alpha, and until they reach that stage they're not going to be able to contribute to the population. So we have a number of birds that are still 20, 25 and still helpers in their na natal group, they haven't had a chance yet to become the big guy um, and do the breeding, so, so things happen very slowly with ground hornbills. They also need these really massive territories. So we're looking at anything from 80 to 100 square kilometers per family group. Um, and in protected areas, that's fine because you know it's an extensive habitat of wildness. But outside of protected areas where we have about two thirds of our population, that, that one territory can span a huge number of different land use types could be a sugarcane farmer, timber farmer, cattle farming, game farming, um, you know, rural villages. And so it means that we need to work with a lot of people to try and make sure that each family group is secure and that at least certainly the land around their breeding site is, is safe and that the people there know, love them and want to protect them. Um, they have high parental investment, so the youngsters have this really intensive and extensive learning phase. Um, they're not really, certainly the males are not really ready to be off on their own until they're about five years. They need to learn from the wild experienced groups, um, members of their group, um, and so that the, they really need this long learning period until they're ready to go off into the big wide world themselves. Um, in a wild context, um, if we can get them past five years, there's a very good chance they live till 70, as long as we can mitigate for as many of those people threats as we can. And as I mentioned, they're cooperative breeders, so there's the alpha pair, the male and female, and just the one female in the group. And generally, all of the other birds in that group are male helpers, mostly offspring of the, of the alpha male. Um, and they're there to help protect the territory, uh, bring food for the female, help hunting, uh, and then obviously when the chick hatches, to help feed the chick as well. And so any of those groups, you know, whether it's just a pair struggling to get going or a huge group of 12, it's just a single breeding female. And so that's what's holding them back in the face of all of these anthropogenic threats. Next slide, please. So it's a lot to do and we've attack of animals as well. Um, so we have these six main pillars that we use to try and tackle it. So we monitor the population to try and make sure that we understand what it is we have um, and know where the problem areas and where to um, focus our resources and our teams and our efforts. The research, certainly, it's, you, that's ongoing. There's so much that we need to understand to make sure that the conservation actions that we're taking are really going to make a difference for the population. Then in terms of restoration, there's a lot that we've started doing and more we can do, providing artificial nests for groups that have lost their nests and reintroducing groups back into areas where they've become locally extinct. And for that, we use wild hatched chicks. The second chick inevitably dies naturally in the wild. Um, they will only ever rear the one. And so we use that redundant chick as the source for our reintroduction stock. And this means so that we can do reintroductions without having any impact on the remaining wild population. So it's like a free source. Um, as long as we rear them carefully, we're able to then use those to build up populations in areas where they've already become locally extinct. Um, as always, as a project, we're trying to improve. We're continually looking at how we operate, um, how we made our decisions, do they need to change in the face of new information, and, and continually growing the skills within our team. Um, mitigation, obviously each one of those threats we need to try and tackle head on. Some we can do as a, as a project on our own, for others we need to, to partner up with other institutions, with government, um, and that's, that kind of thing takes more sort of a policy level change. Um, but we're getting there, certainly things with like the lead and the poisoning, we're slowly starting to shift the, the, the landscape for that. And then probably the most important and, and a thread that runs through all of these is education and awareness. Many South Africans go to Kruger National Park and on any given day they may see uh, five or six groups if they go for a long game drive, um, but that's not a real um, 
snapshot really of the population. And so we, we're working really hard to make everyone understand that outside of our big protected areas, the birds really are in trouble. That's where we need to focus our efforts and we need to work with each and every person that's sharing the land with these birds. Next slide, please. So this is a map of, of our population in South Africa. The gray blocks um, is what we had, um, and the green blocks is what we've got left. And if you look on the top right of the screen, that's our Kruger National Park. And you can almost see the outline of the park in ground humble sightings. And that again, makes it very clear to us that the problem is us. Um, and elsewhere, you know, through KwaZulu-Natal and into the Eastern Cape in the South, that population is really fragmented and those birds are persisting in, in a, a real mixed mosaic of, of habitats and land uses. And so what we've done is instilled a new monitoring plan. It's going to be a four-year plan. And we rely really heavily on South Africans who, who live in each one of those little blocks to report their birds when they see them, um, keep an eye out for them, help us find nests. Um, and so over the four-year period, we're going to be working on those little, those little pentads, the little green squares, remain green if we keep getting sightings of the birds. They go orange if we haven't had a sighting for a year or two. And if they're not sighted again within a four-year period, then that, that block goes red. And that will then highlight for us the areas where we need to focus to try and understand what's happening. Has there been a disease outbreak? Um, is there some trader that's gone mad? Is there someone hunting? Um, to try and understand what the problems are keep that habitat safe so restoration and population expansion can occur and hopefully with that we'll be able to bring on much higher level government support for the species when we have a much better and clearer picture of what's happening across the South African context. Next slide please. So this is just an example. We have these WhatsApp groups that I know with Facebook now, we may need to rethink WhatsApp, um, but so far everyone's still on board. Um, and, and these are, are people who may be timber farmers, cattle farmers, researchers, um, just birders, people who are just interested in the species, community leaders. Um, and what they do in each of their own areas is they run a, a WhatsApp group. They're the admins and people, whenever they see their birds, report into that. And so we get immediate reporting. We get nice photos, even if they're bad, it doesn't matter. Um, and we get a, a sort of, you know, day by day blow of what's happening in terms of that area and the ground humbles they're seeing. And so we're busy collating uh, the data for last year, which was the first year of this process um, and we'll be able to see what, what's happening now. So it's really exciting. The uptake has been enormous. We have 27 of these groups now and, and a lot of them in places where birds have never been reported before. Um, and yeah, it just we've stepped away from just having birders as citizen scientists but expanded our web to include anyone and everyone who's keen and wants to be involved. Next slide, please. So in terms of mitigation, um, obviously we spoke about the nests that we need to try and do something about. Next slide. Um, so that's providing artificial nests. Then in terms of the window breaking, if you look on the bottom left of the screen, that's an example. Ground hornbills will get up onto a windowsill. Thankfully, they only target the windows that they can reach. Um, but it does lead to a huge number of broken windows. Some of these schools that we work with in a given day, ground hornbills can break up to 500 glass panes. Um, and the second image on the bottom left um, is, is where they can also injure themselves. You know, they're trying to squeeze through the, the, the sharp shards of glass. And so it's a double risk. They're making enemies of the people that they share the land with, but there's also a big risk that they injure themselves. So these kids are, are pointing out the contravision, um, which is a perforated vinyl that we put on the windows. And the really cool thing with that is the light is able to get into the classrooms because many of these schools have no electricity. Um, and so the light can still shine in, but it cuts the reflection and that stops the problem. So that seems to be working and, and working well for rural schools, for rural hunting camps. What we haven't come up with yet is a solution for the sort of high-end lodges where you can lie in bed and enjoy the bush felt through your ceiling to floor glass window but it needs to be attractive so we're still trying to come up with a solution for those properties next slide please 
And the education program ongoing, um, this is our mascot, Timber. Timber is a Zulu word meaning hope. Um, and Timber goes with us wherever we go. Um, and we're just trying to, A, get an understanding of what, what these children already know about the birds. Many of them walk past groups on their way to school in the morning, what their thoughts are about them. And then we try and place those groups that they see on a daily basis into the national context and why it's important for them to keep those birds around. Um, and it's fun. We love doing that. Uh, it's an amazing response. We go back to places and the kids come streaming, shouting, Timber, 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 as soon as they see our vehicle. Um, and so we keep the conversation going and we always try and do some sort of craft or activity with the kids so not only are they learning in in the classroom context but they're taking something home so that their conversation can carry on at home with their parents and an extended family next slide um so this is an animation that we've designed we're just going to try and, and share that that video with you now In a small village, there lived a clever girl called Knowledge. One night, as her grandfather said goodnight, she asked him why the rains had not come. The grandfather said that many years ago, there were these giant birds called the ground hornbill, also known as thunder or rain birds, that had a magnificent <laughs> call that would often be followed by good rain. But he hadn't seen one in many years. Maybe that was why there was no rain. The young girl fell into a deep sleep and was startled by a loud sound. It was the ground mm -hmm. hornbill. The giant bird greeted her by name mm -hmm. and asked if she could mm -hmm. help him. He would return to the village and call for the rains. As the two of them walked, the giant thunderbird said that most of the trees that they had nested in had been cut down, forcing them to leave. He said mm -hmm. that they only needed one tree per family and the little girl said she would ask her villagers to protect those specific trees. Thank you, <laughs> said the bird. The few that had stayed only had strange looking trees to roost on. The giant bird pointed to an electricity post. But these trees had often hurt or electrocuted them, forcing their families to leave too. As they continued, knowledge jumped with fright as she saw a large puff adder on the track. But the giant bird marched past her and with one stab <laughs> of its head, killed it and ate it. She was so grateful the snakes terrified her and her family. The giant bird then pointed at a dead rat lying in the field and was about to eat it when the little girl said no. It was probably poisoned and it would kill him if he ate it, she said. Some farmers still use poison to keep the predators or rats away from their livestock or food. The little girl said she would discuss alternatives with the village like good kraals, herd dogs or cats to keep away the predators and rats. Thank you, said the bird as he hopped excitedly mm -hmm. along. The bird then walked past a window and immediately began to attack it. The little girl quickly covered the window with a blanket and he instantly stopped. Why did you do that, she asked. The bird said mm -hmm. he had seen another ground hornbill in the window and needed to defend his territory, nest and wife. <laughs> While chuckling to herself, she covered some of the other lower windows so he wouldn't break them. As they passed a particular house, the giant bird pointed at the house and said that some of the men from that house had tried to catch and kill him, believing that if they did, they would steal his great voice and make themselves more powerful. The little girl thought for a moment and said that the voice of one man is not as important as the voice that brings the rain. I will tell my people of all the dangers you face. I think we can make our village safe for you to return, and hopefully, if you are happy and safe, also call the rain and perhaps kill a couple of snakes as well. The bird began to flap excitedly and call loudly. The sound of thunder echoed through the air. And I think they will listen, she said. After all, her name was Knowledge. Thank you for sharing that. If we can go back to the presentation. So, so we did that as a way of trying to reconnect um, kids with, with these birds um, and the cultural heritage that they have. Um, and we're hoping that once we get the translations done into all the languages that we need them to be, these kids will be able to share this virally, um, share it with their parents, and obviously we'd love it if it went viral. Um, so we've also done a follow-up on that. So we have these comic books called Vusa, the Ground Hornbill Guardian, um, and it tells a similar story with a boy this time walking his dog, um, 
and they, they go through the landscape, they explore the threats and what can be done to, to change and improve things for the ground hornbill, again, the bird that brings the rain. Um, so yeah, ideally we would love to get one of these into the hands of every child that shares the land with ground hornbills. Next slide. So the reintroductions then is taking those tiny little pink things that we rescue from the wild nests and trying to turn them into viable breeding groups out in the wild, able to hold their own, breed successfully. Um, and so it's been a really slow, long process to learn how to do it. Um, they're really complex birds to work with. But we finally worked out a system. Certainly the hand rearing um, is, is where it needs to be. We have about a 90% success rate if we can harvest those chicks within the first three days of hatching. Um, and we now start to be able to build the population through this. Um, it's been largely experimental until about five years ago, and now we're starting to expand that. Um, and we estimate that if we can release three new groups a year, um, we'll be able to really make meaningful gains um, in, in slowing the population declines and actually start turning things around for population growth. Next slide, please. Um, to do that, we, we had to dig deep um, because they're such complex birds, uh, just rearing in a normal sort of zoo facility um, wasn't working and we needed to try and figure out a way to, to rear these birds in an environment where they were having no or very little interaction with humans um, and re were really able to, to just you know, we have, have everything going for them to make sure that they were reared wild um, with all the right developmental skills, um, fledging into existing wild groups, uh, sorry, captive groups, and from there they go out into the wild. Um, if you can just share this video, this is just a video. So that's a, essentially a baobab tree in the middle with aviaries extending out of that. Um, and the chicks then are reared in that top room of the baobab tree um, and, and they fledge into those captive groups. And then from there, they go out into the wild where they will spend four or five years learning their bush skills in a managed group that we call a bush school. And then from there, they go on themselves to become breeding groups. Um, it's a very slow system, um, but it's working. Um, and so we, we're looking to upscale that in the next, next five years. Next slide. So although they've got a lot going against them, um, we really feel that the more we learn about them, we're finding opportunity within their biology, within things like the cultural protection that's inherent in many parts of their range. Um, and so we've been able to develop strong conservation tools that are working. We've built strong collaborations. So, you know, we don't always know how to do things, but we work hard to find the right people so that we've got all of the best minds working um, to try and solve the ground humble problems. Um, so as a consequence, everything that we do is multidisciplinary, uh, social science, graphic designers, um, you name it, educators. We, we've got a, an amazing team, multi-skilled, and where we don't have the skills, we try and find the best people to support our work. Um, all of our uh, decisions we try and ensure are evidence-based um, and if we don't have enough information we try and make sure that we use adaptive management as we go um, until we're able to have enough data to, to support our decisions. Um, the bird itself is iconic. Um, everyone loves them. You know, they don't necessarily always understand them. They might have fear of them, but they're certainly a very strong icon of the African bush felt and savannas. They're a flagship species. So any of the threats that we can fix for them is supporting a world of other species. The ground hornbills themselves are opportunistic. You know, if they find a free food source, they're going to utilize it. One of our best, most successful groups, their nest is about 300 meters from a nightclub um, in a local community um, because they found where the village um, does all the offal dumping from the local butchery. And so they just walk between the nest and back to the offal dump um, and they rear chicks year after year after year. It's by far the most successful group we have. Um, maybe they like the music at the nightclub, not sure. Um, but you know, they're doing amazingly. And so they, they're going to find a way into the future and we just need to find ways to support them to do that. They're flexible. They, they will try and find a way to adapt as long as we can support where we need to. And with that huge cultural protection that exists in some areas, I do really strongly believe we'll be able to turn it around for the species. Next slide, please. 
And this very exciting news came in yesterday. This is um, the nest of my artificial nest um, for one of our reintroduced groups. Um, we released them a long time ago. The male is now 10, he's breeding female is 12, and the helpers in that group are six and three. Um, and they laid a single egg a couple of years ago, but it was a really bad rainfall year and they didn't manage to pull that chick through. This year they laid a single egg again. Um, and if you look at the top of the slide, the little brown egg, it looks like one of the group members actually carried a guinea fowl egg into the nest. So we know they're dead keen on breeding, even if they have to steal other eggs. Um, and this photo was taken yesterday. Um, they're really doing an amazing job. That chick is looking fit and healthy, um, and it looks like they're going to successfully fledge their own chick. Um, and all of those birds are hand reared. You know, these are the chicks that would have died in the nest. Um, so huge kudos to the hand rearers, to everyone involved in pulling this through. They're doing it. They're doing it themselves. Um, next slide, please. And so I just want to thank you for your time. Um, it's been amazing to, yeah, just to be able to share what we do. And if you'd like any more information, that's my email address, project at ground-hornbill.org.za or our website, ground-hornbill.org.za. Um, and we have a YouTube channel if you'd like to watch any of those videos in full. Um, yeah, and it's just been a really lovely experience and massive thank you to Maryland Zoo for, for allowing this. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. I loved, loved those animations. It's a wonderful story. Um, there we go. Um, so we did have a couple questions come through our Q and A. Um, so if anybody does have any additional questions, please definitely um, ask um, through the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, so we had a question about the total population in the wilds. Um, all right, so for South Africa, we've got a pretty good handle on that. We've got about 1,500 to 2,000 adults, which equates to about 430 groups. Um, and obviously that means 430 breeding females um, because each of those groups only has one female. Um, so that we know, um, we're busy working with Zimbabwe now to try and help them get a handle on theirs. Um, we're running a workshop in Namibia later this year, COVID depending. Um, so we don't really have a clear idea of the full population, but for South Africa, we've got a good handle. We know that in Swaziland, they essentially extinct already. There's one group of three birds left, that's it. Um, and so we're gonna look to try and um, create gene flow um, naturally through reintroductions to try and support that population to try and bring them back. I hope that answers that. It does, thank you. So this leads into a perfect, um, the next question is how has the global pandemic changed how you do your work? Um, in a way, at the start of it, it was actually quite good for us because it forced us to sit down and analyze data. Um, it's always more fun being in the fields than sat in the office. Um, so we've had a chance to really just um, pull together what we've got and reassess and, and do a bit more strategic planning, um, developing a, a national biodiversity management plan, which hopefully will be gazetted by government later this year. Um, so in terms of getting stuck into the data side of things, it's been good. Um, we've definitely taken a funding hit. Um, we have managed to keep all of our team on. Um, but yeah, and then obviously just in terms of being able to get out into the communities and schools, um, that's been on the back burner just because we've had such big lockdowns, we haven't been able to travel. Um, so that's probably in terms of the breeding and the harvest and, and the general monitoring, that's, that's been fine. We've been able to tick along on that. Excuse me. Um, so we've had um, so many, a, a couple other questions come in. So we had a congratulations on the new chick. Um, do you know how many chicks hatch each year um, from your hand raised birds that you pre-released? Um, so at the moment in the wild, normally we have a 50-50% um, chance of groups deciding to breed. Um, and this year, 75% of the reintroduced groups have bred. So it's also been an excellent rain year, so that's helped. Um, so, so this year has been 75%. Um, yeah, it's, it's been a good year. And in the picture you shared, it showed one hornbill egg and one guinea fowl egg. Do they typically lay only one egg um, or are they prone to lay more than one? So they lay one to three. It's not common to find just one. So it's odd that this female just seems to stick with one, but she's also learning, you know, this is only her second breeding attempt. And we do find it takes them a couple of years to get going. Um, 
it's usually two, um, and then those eggs are laid five or six days apart. So the, the first laid egg will hatch, and then only five or six days later, the second one will hatch. And then what happens, I see there's a question there on how we choose which, which of the chicks to take. The, the second hatch chick is obviously so much smaller than the first hatch. And so if the first chick is good and strong, the parents will continue to feed that chick and support that chick. And the second little one kind of just withers away. It pretty much dies of parental neglect. However, if there's something wrong with that first chick the parents will then abandon the first one and rear the second one so it's like a natural insurance policy so we only take the second hatch chick um, if the first chick is good and strong um, we make sure obviously they're much better at this than we are so priority is they rear one good chick and we take the chick that would be uh, would die naturally in the nest the redundant chick and do you have to when you are removing chicks from their nests do you have to wait till the, the adults leave? I can imagine that they're quite large birds and it could be troublesome to sneak into their nests. So, so we find usually the female, as soon as we put the ladder up against the tree, um, she, she leaves the nest. Um, occasionally we have females that we call sitters where they just look at you and you're like, mm, now what? Um, and sometimes if she's sitting tight, we leave it and we don't bother her. You know, we can move to, we can use another nest if necessary. Um, but it's really only, we only sort of see um, aggressive behavior from captive reared birds. Um, the wild birds just get out the way or look at you menacingly, but we, we haven't been nailed yet. No. <laughs> and there's no worry of disturbing a nest site that if you're only taking one egg or one chick, that the parents won't return back to that nest site. No, the, the risk of nest abandonment is early on. So usually either when they're getting the nest ready or after she's laid the first egg. So we have very strict protocols in, in place. We only ever assess nests twice. Uh, we candle the eggs on the first visit. And from that, we're able to establish when hatch date is. And then we come back um, when we expect the second chick to hatch and assess the situation then. So they get two visits a year um, and that's it. And then we'll come back much later just to, to, to see how the, the, the wild chick is doing. Um, but that's usually two or three months later after that. Um, yeah, the, you know, once she's decided to sit and stick, um, yeah, and, and we quick, we have sort of a maximum 10 minutes at the nest time. Very interesting. Uh, so we had a question about the extra females. So you said that they are often groups of male helpers in a group. Um, yeah. What about the females that are not paired up? Do they pair up in their own group? Do they just kind of hang out on their own? All right, so, so the females um, generally um, get kicked out of the group when they're less than a year old. On average, it's about 11 months, and they have to go it alone in the wilds. So, you know, they, they're out there with cheetah and leopards and caracal and big eagles. They don't really know how to fend for themselves, um, but they make it some. I mean, obviously, there's, there's higher mortality within the females, whereas the males stick with the group. So they can fledge, I'm sorry, they can disperse anything from five years to 25 years which also makes it very hard to do population modeling for the species um but yeah so the females kind of go it alone sometimes they might bound up with other females for company we see them sometimes in the company of other species baboons and parla they don't like being alone ground hornbills really hate being alone um and so yeah the females then are essentially waiting until they reach sexual maturity until one of the alpha females in a group is lost for whatever reason um, and they're able to replace her so that's generally generally what happens and we find that the young females disperse about five territories away from their natal group whereas the boys seem to just go next door one or two territories away from home um, so that seems to be how gene flow happens within the population and you mentioned that their nests are up in trees and that you needed a ladder to access them what do your artificial nests look like uh, the, the opening slide was one of those, um, uh, so they, they kind of look a bit like dinosaur eggs, um, but they're big sort of bolder looking things with a hollow. Um, we've tried to make them fit all the proportions that ground hornbills like, um, and then also to try and make sure that in the face of rising climate, that these artificial nests are going to be good in 10 or 20 or 30 years, that you know even if we do get a, a one and a half to two degree rise, that those embryos aren't going to cook in the eggs, which is something that we're finding at the moment. I think we actually have one of your videos that have the nest in it, so we can go ahead and share that if you'd like. Why not? 
the begging of that youngster is enough to drive you mad. <laughs> uh, but that is typical begging youngster. And you can see the male in that video bringing nest lining to the nest. Um, yeah, and that's what, that's what those nests look like. So this year we're running a trial. We've got 10 of those up in the wild now, you know, excluding the reintroduced groups. Um, and we're monitoring temperature and humidity just to make sure that they're going to hold. And if not, before we build this year, we'll, we'll adjust the thickness of the walls to make sure that they insulate that female and the eggs from the heat better. Um, this was something that I was wondering as you were talking about um, your work within the community. Did it take any extra efforts or um, interaction on social media to grow your citizen science bird monitoring through the WhatsApp app. Um, kind of what methods did you use to get that started? Um, we got it started more from being on the ground. You know, you meet a farmer at a supermarket who sees your vehicle with the decals and wants to chat about the birds on his farm. Um, so it's kind of been organic. Um, we've definitely used uh, citizen science. Certainly within Kruger National Park, we've got posters up all over the park. Um, and uh, I think we've seen a uh, my, my colleague Jared will be able to tell me exactly, but I think we've seen something like a tenfold increase in WhatsApp sightings um, from the park, um, which is fantastic, um, but obviously it's the sightings outside of the protected areas which are sort of more valuable to us. Um, you know, those are the ones we would really need to know where they are so we can interact with the landowners, try and, and, and we run a custodianship program, so we, we sit in, yeah, so we sit in with farmers, with landowners, with community leaders, um, and try and work through any potential threats, and if they're happy to mitigate the threats, and then we sign a pledge, um, and they get signage, and yeah, so we're growing this custodianship network, trying to protect certainly the nest site, and then with time and resources, we're able to expand that. Wonderful. Um, the, uh, back to the the horn um, about back to their nest. Um, <laughs> one of our uh, colleagues here at the zoo is wondering, and he's uh, very familiar with work with penguins in South Africa, um, but mm -hmm. wanting to know if northerns would northerners would use something similar as your nest prototype. I think so. Um, again, we don't know a lot about the Northerns. So I've got a PhD student in Ghana who's starting up this year. Um, and we're going to just try and do the basic biology of the species, see how they compare to the Southerns. Um, you know, if things are similar, that's great, because hopefully we've developed a bunch of tools that we can just kind of flop over to the Northerns. Um, but I, I imagine they would, you know, it's a, it's a nice solid hollow. Um, yeah, keeps them cool. Um, a question about why are they called ground hornbills um, and kind of leads into what is their diet? All right, so they're called ground hornbills because they spend most of their time on the ground. Um, they, they walk as a group through the long, through the long grass, through the short grass, they don't like long grass, um, and hunting. So they kind of hunt spread out across the landscape, it's sort of like a gang moving across the landscape. Um, and they will they will eat whatever they can catch. So it's mostly vertebrates, grasshoppers and beetles and things. Um, but if they come across a snake, they'll take it, even really highly venomous snakes, which is one of the reasons that they quite respected and awed is, you know, most people living in rural places don't like snakes. Um, and um, myself included now that my partner's in hospital for a snake bite. Um, so they, um, they, yeah, they eat whatever they can catch and scorpions, chameleons, lizards, uh, small birds, pretty much if they can catch it and swallow it. Um, they, they term fornivorous instead of carnivorous because they eat the whole fauna, the whole animal with scales and fur and chitin and whatever. Yeah, very interesting. I don't know why I didn't put two in together. Um, very interesting. Um, so we had a question about breaking windows and are they known to break car windows like they are with building windows? Unfortunately, yes. Um, with our resident group at Mobula, we have to keep all of our vehicles in shade clock garages. And with our team, there's a rule if you leave the, the vehicle out and the windows broken, it's your expense. Um, you know, they're just any shiny surface where they can see themselves, it's an enemy um, and they're going to attack it. So yes, and it does, it makes for unhappy neighbors. Um, and unfortunately with that comes some um, either injury or, or death, fatality, retaliation. Um, from unhappy people. Yeah. So I have been saving this question um, for last. Um, and I think it's a perfect way to kind of wrap up here is how can we help hornbill species um, from different places all over the world? 
I think just share that they're in trouble. You know, uh, hornbills, we need to get word out that hornbills, all hornbills, but especially the bigger, bigger species and certainly the ground hornbills in Africa um, are going to need a lot of support. And unfortunately, with support comes resources. Um, you know, so if, if people want to have a fundraising event, we would love that. Um, and just, yeah, share, share the message as much as much as you can. Thank you. So the Maryland Zoo has been following the Nabula Ground Hornbill Project and supporting you guys um, since 2017. Um, and we are proud to have you as our conservation partners. And here at the zoo, we do have three northern ground hornbills that look slightly different than the southern ground hornbills that are part of the AZA species survival plan. And we have a breeding pair here at the zoo that are located up um, at the front of the zoo near the shuttle stop. And then we have one male that's down in our Sidatunga yard. Um, and while the Mabula ground hornbill project mainly focuses on the southern ground hornbill, there's kind of an overlap, correct, between the northern and the southern species um, that we have here at the zoo. So where, at what point do they kind of overlap throughout the continent? Sorry, my desk just sort of collapsed. Um, they, they, they barely overlap, actually. So there's a tiny um, area of overlap in Kenya and a little bit into Uganda. Um, but that map that I showed, the blue um, sort of along the North Africa, north of the equator is the range for the northern. Um, and the red that I showed in that map from South Africa all the way to southern Kenya. So there is a, actually only a little bit of overlap. I'd love to go there and see it. I'd love to be in a space where I can see them both. Um, yeah, and I would love to come and visit your birds sometime once this COVID mess is over and we can travel again. Yes, of course, we would of course love to have you come here and, and visit us and, and learn more about what new things you have going on. Um, so thank you. If, if anyone did have any other last minute questions, feel free to ask. Um, but if not, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kemp, for joining us. And thank you to our sponsor, CSNH Group, for helping us um, bring these field talks uh, to so many participants. Cool. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.